good day, everyone, and uh, especially to our distinguished speakers, Professor Ned Cook from Yale University, as well as Professor Vimalan Rajiva Charkul of the University of Delaware. She also has a Chinese name, Xu Guan'er. Welcome everyone to the Zoom webinar on global objects and the need for material literacy, co-hosted by Princeton University Press, China office, and the Yale Center Beijing. I'm Carolee Rafferty, Executive Director of Yale Center Beijing and a Yale College alumna. For those of you who may be new to Yale Center Beijing events, the center is Yale University's only university-wide center outside of the U.S. Throughout the year, we host events such as these, um, whether over Zoom or in person, where we convene thought leaders from all sectors to discuss the most interesting, cutting edge, and critical topics facing humanity. Today, we're delighted to be able to invite Yale professor Edward Cook to give a presentation about his book, new book, Global Objects Toward a Connected Art History, which is published by the Princeton University Press. We're also delighted to have Professor Vimalan Rujivacharku um, from the University of Delaware to have a discussion with him on this topic. And we're so um, grateful for uh, to both of you for your time and preparation. We're very glad to be collaborating with the Princeton University Press China office to co-host co this important webinar for the Chinese audience. The Princeton University Press is one of the world's leading academic publishers, which brings scholarly ideas to the world by publishing peer-reviewed books that connect authors and readers across spheres of knowledge to advance and enrich the global conversation. And the Princeton University Press China office, with whom Yale Center Beijing has worked closely to prepare for this event, is committed to fostering cross-cultural exchanges and further advancing the international dialogues of scholars. So throughout the talk, um, we'll, we'll see Professor, uh, Professor Cook's presentation. He'll have some slides um, and Professor um, Vimalan Ruju Bacharakul will also be um, kind of engaging in a discussion um, on this topic. Now, let me introduce our two distinguished speakers. Professor Ned Cook is a Yale College alumnus and the Charles F. Montgomery Professor of American Decorative Arts in the Department of History of Art at Yale University. His work focuses upon material culture and decorative arts with an emphasis on the relationship between production and consumption. At Yale, Professor Cook teaches lecture courses on American material culture, an introductory course on global decorative arts, and offers seminars on a variety of topics, including craft and design in India and in Australia. He has written extensively on modern craft as an author, a founding co-editor of the Journal of Modern Craft, guest editor of a special issue of American art focusing on craft, as well as his work as co-curator and publication author of multiple exhibitions, including Inspired by China, Contemporary Furniture Makers Explore Chinese Traditions at the Peabody Essex Museum in 2006. He's the author of several books on material culture and decorative arts, including the book of today's talk, Global Objects Toward a Connected Art History, published by the Princeton University Press. In this groundbreaking book, Professor Cook breaks down traditional hierarchies in the field of art history by bridging the divide between fine art, paintings, architecture, and sculpture, and material culture through an examination of these more functional objects around the world. In doing so, he's charting exciting new directions in art history by presenting a more inclusive and expansive perspective on made objects and their uses, meaning and cultural value through time. Professor's work in expanding, Professor Cook's work in expanding the field of decorative arts has led to many awards, including election as an honorary fellow of the American Craft Council and College Arts Association 
Distinguished Teacher of Art History Award. We're very grateful for his generosity in making time for this talk for the Chinese audience. Professor Vimalan Rujivacharkul teaches history of art and architecture at the University of Delaware. She also concurrently holds the 2021 to 2024 visiting professorship at the School of Architecture at Tsinghua University and is a lifetime fellow of Clare Hall at Cambridge University. She researches and publishes on architectural history and his historiography, material culture and object studies, history of cartography and history of global collecting. Among her publications are Architecturalized Asia, which was selected by choice as an outstanding book in 2014, Liang Sicheng, and the Temple, Temple of Buddha's Light, which was included in the China Classic Series by China's Ministry of Education, and Collecting China, the World, China, and a Short History of Collecting, which became the ground for the 2017 workshop that she co-directed at the Winter Third Museum for the National Museum of Asian Arts Chinese Object Study. At Tsinghua University, she works with colleagues in the history of architecture with emphasis on preserving village and vernacular architecture in China. We're also very, very delighted to have her um, to be in conversation with Professor Ned Cook today. Now, throughout this web webinar, please feel free to type your questions in the Zoom chat box. And the first person um, to pose a question to our speakers who's not a Yale Center Beijing staff member and not a Princeton University Press staff member, um, will get a complimentary copy of Professor Cook's new book, thanks to the Princeton University Press's generosity. I'd also like to encourage all of you to purchase a copy of Global Objects towards a connected, an interconnected art history as the professors who joined these Yale Center Beijing lectures do so out of their kindness, generosity to the Yale community. And it is very important that we support their work and encourage them to continue engaging with the Yale community in China. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Ned Cook. Um, and Ned, please um, queue up your, uh, uh, share your screen um, so we can get it going. Thank you. All right. Carol, is that um, on now? Yes, it's on. Well, thanks to um, to Carol and Devin for organizing this, as well as for Vimalan um, willing to be a partner um, early in the morning here on the eastern seaboard of the U.S. And it's a it's a real delight to be able to speak to a um, a broader international audience about this um, kind of project because it really does get at the heart of the way we are connected as human beings. Um, you know, for many of us, um, the accepted notion of art is one that privileges a certain kind of um, creative um, activity and creative product. Um, we tend to think about monumental public architecture. We tend to think about um, framed paintings. And that what we do is we, we honor them in some respects because they have a certain fixity. They're fixed in place. Um, they have, um, they're usually stable. Um, yes, there's some variations in architecture. Paintings get reframed or might be cleaned, um, but they oftentimes are very well documented. They've existed in some sort of a public dimension uh, for quite some time. And I just want to use this uh, portrait by Arthur Devis, um, painted of Mr. and Mrs. Hill, upper uh, middle class British couple, hanging in the Yale Center for British Art um, currently, but certainly earlier was in the Hills uh, and their descendants' uh, homes. And I think that it, it sort of represents so well um, the way in which we really focus in on what are known, quote, works of art, um, that it is um, something that is uh, an obvious medium that we're comfortable elevating to that status. It's oil uh, painting on canvas. It's um, 
indicates sort of a certain degree of self-fashioning um, by the couple who are really presenting themselves to people who came and visited the house, oftentimes an exclusive audience, but it's uh, a way in which they are presenting themselves to that limited world. Um, it's commemorative um, in that it really celebrates who they are uh, for either their friends or subsequent generations. And there's a known artist, the artist signs it. Um, so all these things that sort of really start to um, create to uh, the, the value of this kind of uh, work of art over time. And yet in the background, sitting on top of a mahogany table, they're, the couple are obscuring mahogany chairs. There's a tea service. Um, and, you know, sort of thinking about a teapot as a minor kind of player pushed to the background and using kind of the uh, theatrical uh, metaphor of someone like Irving Goffman uh, in the presentation of everyday life, it's merely a prop um, that the real focus is on the actors, the couple, and the stage set, which is the interior of their home. Props exist really sort of only in a very um, supplementary way um, that are not really key players um, in the value of this particular object. They are merely affirming. But what I'm intrigued with is flipping the script. What happens if we make the painting, the one that we value now, in service of the larger object, um, of all of a sudden making that teapot larger in scale to dominate um, this kind of um, value system um, and to think about what about a skillfully made functional object? Um, and it's not quite as stable um, as the painting might be um, because objects tend to be messy. Um, they draw from ideas and materials from throughout the world. They move. Um, they don't hang on the wall and stay there. Um, they get used in different ways. Um, they might get repurposed. Um, something like a teapot could be used as a pat boat for somebody elderly or uh, infirm who needs to have basically an adult Tommy Tippy cup um, to be able to drink uh, fluids from. It could get uh, worn out. It might actually become uh, pieces, uh, sherds rather than actually a whole object. And it's not simply to think about this object as functional or aesthetic alone. It's not even innocent. It actually has a very complicated history of engagement, of entanglement uh, with the world. If we were to think of this teapot, um, it really represents the conflation of lots of different ideas, materials, and value systems. Um, it's based on um, smaller uh, Chinese stoneware vessels, um, but it's elevated in typical um, fashion of to a venti size, um, you know, to think about a Starbucks uh, metaphor here, um, that it's supersized um, kind of uh, consumption of, um, of tea, um, which is also at this point in time in the 17th and 18th century, a Chinese product. So you have a form that's based on China for a material that's Chinese in origin, but yet it's mixed with sugar, which is grown in the Caribbean with uh, sl enslaved labor on um, on plantations, um, so that the sugar gets mixed in um, with the tea itself and becomes a much more charged uh, kind of object. Then there's the body, uh, that is the material itself, unlike using purplish stoneware in China or even porcelain later on, um, it's refined earthenware. Um, it's something that Josiah Wedgwood um, in Staffordshire really developed of mixing lighter colored clays, making them um, much uh, purer in some respects, and then mixing in a white clay called kaolin, uh, which actually was um, brought in from Cherokee country in North Carolina, um, it would, where it was really called uniker. Um, and Wedgwood has this exclusive contract to extract white clay from the Cherokee country to bring to England to mix in with his local earthenwares to create this refined earthenware that simulates um, the look of porcelain. So 
in that pursuit of whiteness, he's again sort of looking throughout the world to bring together materials. Then on top of that, you have the decoration uh, of this, which is not hand painted, um, but it's actually a printing technology. It's a transfer of print um, off of a copper plate that they could produce the same image time and time over and over again on a series of teapots. And in it, what they do is they really sort of become very prescriptive about what's the proper use uh, for an aspiring um, middle class um, to use this teapot to show you that you should have a table, you should have um, the kinds of accoutrements, you should have some sort of servant, and oftentimes you even see enslaved um, servants behind pouring, doing the actual physical labor um, while the couple in front are merely at leisure. In some respects, this is a different kind of portrait, a portrait that actually moves through time and through space. And so for me, um, it's really thinking about elevating an object like this to a more sustained kind of analysis to really contextualize it and to unpack it in as many different ways as possible to give it that sense of impact that maybe um, something like the diva's portrait of the hills is more of a one trick um, pony uh, in some respects. And so that's why I ended up um, really working on this book, which is based on a course I've been teaching for eight years now that is designed as an alternative to the usual um, kind of um, introduction to art history. And by looking at functional, um, aesthetically um, kind of charged objects um, of really trying to make a human history of art as opposed to one that is uh, distant or removed from a great number of people. And thinking about um, the ways in which you, we really need to put together the concept of realization um, that is making something and then also um, the kind of circulation, what happens when it moves from the shop out into the world. Um, and that can be both movement as well as meaning. Um, and so the, the book is really um, set up to sort of move from, from the raw material throughout the world into production, into movement, uh, circulation, um, and then ultimately sort of the afterlife as the object um, continues to, uh, to move through time and space and perhaps uh, get repurposed, perhaps get uh, maintained, um, perhaps uh, reworked uh, in some respects. And I thought I would just sort of walk you through the content of these three different uh, kinds of sections that one is to think about making and the importance of materials um, and understanding the logic of materials and the logic of making. And I thought two good examples of this might be um, the raffia cushion cover on the left, um, and then this textile fragment from Gujarat uh, from the 15th century. Um, the raffia cover um, is, you know, in the raffia palm in Western Africa um, was used as a source of thread of splitting up uh, the frond, twisting it together, um, keeping it moist uh, during this, and then weaving it on a tension loom but weaving with such um, incredible kind of uh, technical expertise, you could also make it plush. That is, you could have some uh, of the wefts be supplementary and cut them so you have a pile um, to these sorts of fabrics. You could create different kinds of uh, weave patterns to create um, diamonds um, shapes that you see in the example on the left. Highly sophisticated work in which these cloths were oftentimes used and exchanged among the different kingdoms in West Africa as sort of um, tribute cloth, um, status cloth. Um, this was a way of affirming uh, connections with one another. So there was a real value of these and oftentimes it's woven as cloaks. When the Portuguese started to um, come down the African coast um, trading um, in the 16th century, they looked at this cloth and the, their reference point was thinking about cut velvet being produced in, um, in Europe at this point. And they saw this as incredibly sophisticated and the local African uh, kings also saw the ways the Portuguese looked at this. Um, the Portuguese described it as fine as the best linen coming from the low countries. 
And the African um, king started to give these uh, cloths um, as a form of ambas- uh, sort of um, diplomatic gifts, um, thinking that it would create them as equals to the Portuguese um, explorers, merchants, um, and um, missionaries. And many of these uh, objects were then taken uh, back, and you see examples in which the uh, the Congo are trying to use this as a way of building up alliances with European powers, um, even to the Vatican, but how quickly um, they start to become disengaged from a sense of localness. Um, I mean, this is this is a piece that is really extraordinary because it's a European form of pillow cover um, that has been stitched, uh, seamed on the inside, that they've basically stitched this uh, inside out, put it back um, together, um, so back uh, right side out um, to create this uh, cushion cover, something that was very not um, made in the Congo, but it was quickly um, sort of lost its uh, African heritage um, when it was inventoried in the Swedish royal collection. And there was a lot of exchange among different uh, royal courts in 1670, it was described as being Portuguese, which suggests its route from Africa to Portugal and then in the 18th century, it was thought to be from Southeast Asia. Um, and to me, it's it's fascinating how no one thought it could possibly be from the Congo, um, that it was a, of such fine quality. The Gujarat cloth is also um, a really interesting case study um, in that it was made for the Egyptian uh, market. You can see sort of in the lower right corner that kind of pseudo um, Islamic script um, that shows an awareness and the Gujaratis um, who have, because of the climate, have uh, wonderful uh, cotton, um, but they also have um, a uh, a plant, a che root, um, that is really ideal for reds, really color fast reds um, in, dye, in their dye stuffs. They have ideal water for setting um, these kinds of dyes, the indigo for the blue, and you know we tend to think about Egyptian cotton today, but actually in the 15th century, Egypt was still very much of a linen culture, um, which dates back into ancient Egypt. Um, their cotton industry is actually much more recent. And Gujarat was engaged in a lot of um, Indian um, trade uh, across the Indian Ocean to the Arab Peninsula and to East Africa and was producing cloth for that export market as early as the 10th century. Um, Again, making good use of their supply of materials, cotton, um, their dye stuffs uh, like indigo or che root, also known as matter, um, and also um, the the technology that they had for knowing how to do block printing of cutting wooden blocks and being able to register this sort of uh, decoration on large swaths of cloth. A second example um, in which we sort of talk about uh, the ways in which uh, local materials and conventions um, might have different impact on similar kinds of forms would be these two cabinets. Um, On the left, uh, one from the Netherlands. Again, these are from the same time period um, in which the overall effect of this, um, what is called oyster veneering, that is taking the olive wood and cutting cross sections of it. So you have a whole series of circles that are all veneered over the surface. Um, and it really sort of emphasizes um, this idea of uh, of a very thin veneer surface, um, that it's surface decoration. And in many ways you could say it embodies uh, that Dutch aesthetic of houting, um, which wants ordered depth, which is really conveyed within these cross sections of legible spatial relations, uh, luscious color harmony. If you think about a lot of Dutch still life paintings at at this time period, this is it uh, replicated in another natural material. Um, And it's a cabinet that you would open up the doors and you'd have drawers behind in which you could put your uh, collectible items. In Pulakut in the Coromandel Coast in East uh, India, um, what you've got is the same form of a doored cabinet with drawers behind it, a drawer underneath it set up on uh, on legs with that same sort of uh, barbell stretcher connecting the legs that you see in the Dutch example. But in this case, 
it's totally different kind of material um, approach. Um, they are using ebony, um, a wood that comes from that lower, uh, from Tamil Nadu, uh, the lower Coromandel coast uh, in Sri Lanka. Um, the wood is carved. Um, almost every part of the surface is carved. Um, it um, has uh, this, this kind of uh, sheen to it. Um, ebony is a, a wonderful wood, tight grained, um, very dense and heavy that takes this kind of vegetal um, kind of motif, which actually is very similar to the jolly screens in mosques um, throughout uh, different parts of the Mughal Empire. And here, um, what you might say is, rather than expressing uh, this idea of howding, um, you know, they're, they're taking a Dutch form and Pulikut is a Dutch factory that is a Dutch trading post on the Coromandel coast, but they are, um, having um, the local makers work with their own traditions to embody um, these Sanskrit notions of boga, which is this idea of a really rich, sensuous uh, kind of handling of materials, which is that densely carved uh, ebony. And then also marga, um, an intent to blend different regional aesthetics. Um, in this case, blending the Dutch with the local kind of perspective. So I just use those two pairings to sort of show the richness. If you pay attention to materials and processes um, of seeing these kinds of uh, equivalences or uh, ways in which people can respond at the same time using local traditions and local materials. Many times people are looking at these objects and trying to sort of freeze them in place. Um, if you go to museums, um, it seems like oftentimes if you put a piece of decorative art on view, you oftentimes have something literally trying to recreate what it looked like as it left the shop, as it, um, you know, just as it was born in essence. Um, but yet objects moved. Um, and this becomes uh, a really important part of the story of why they are hard to track uh, in some respects, how you can sort of find them stable at certain moments in time. And I think that the whole story of blue and white uh, ceramic is one of these fascinating stories. And many times people think about its relationship to Chinese porcelain. Um, that's always been the blue and white story, but yet blue and white actually has a complicated story right from the beginning in the ninth century where You've got um, the different kinds of Abbasid uh, technology and ceramics that is covering a orangey kind of earthenware with a white tin oxide um, and then using cobalt, um, which was found in greater Iran at this time, to paint blue decoration on that uh, white tin glazed oxide and how trade from uh, of the aromatics of uh, incense, uh, myrrh, et cetera, from the Arab Peninsula to China uh, in the ninth century, um, and then bringing ceramics back had introduced uh, white stoneware um, to, uh, to the Arab Peninsula. And then um, that blue and white technique that uh, emerges in places like Basra then starts to impact what's going on in Chinese stoneware uh, in the north of China, such as you see uh, on the right, where most of the time um, stoneware uh, in China had really been white, celadon, um, did not have cobalt blue. Um, and cobalt becomes another one of these export items. Um, and in fact, in Qing to Chen, um, they oftentimes referred to um, the blue paint as Muslim blue because it came from Iran. Um, early on until they started developing uh, some of their own blues. This really sort of sets up this, uh, you know, in greater Iran, they move from even tin glaze earthenware to using fritware, which is sort of ground quartz and white clay um, and uh, glass frit to create this even more brilliant white body. And one has to think about fritware coming from um, greater Iran and porcelain, uh, coming from Qing to Chen uh, initially as the two centers of blue and white porcelains uh, in the 13th century. And the fact that they are both uh, really strong traditions, um, it's not like one preceded the other, but they almost sort of 
grew out um, simultaneously out of some of the same impulses that had been going on for several hundred years. And you can see even in some of this early work um, being produced in Qing to Chen, that they were very much aware of the Islamic market of having this pseudo script as a decorative device. Um, and in fact, you can see this uh, back and forth, as it were, um, the movement of ideas uh, through objects. Um, the bunch of grapes pattern um, gets produced in both porcelain as well as in fritware. And all the great collections, either in um, the imperial collections in, um, in China or in um, the uh, Artable Shrine in Isfahan or in Topkapi Palace in uh, Istanbul, it's always a mix of both fritware and Chinese porcelain. They were considered equivalent um, at this moment in time. And how that idea of blue and white um, being uh, sort of the, the top of the ceramic uh, pyramid at this point influences a number of other uh, people to continue to produce knockoffs, as it were. Um, so the Portuguese sort of working in that Mediterranean tradition uh, from the early Arab world starts to work with tin glaze earthenware um, and producing plates that, uh, and dishes uh, that really uh, mimic um, the uh, export ware that was being produced in Qing to Chen, the so-called crock ware that you see on the left, or how the, uh, the Dutch also got in on this uh, of producing tin glazed earthenware sort of at a different price point uh, than the imported uh, kind of um, Qing to Chen pottery. But it's not simply trickle down uh, from sort of a China to the European producers, there's oftentimes a back and forth. Um, and this series, I think, really shows um, the ways in which this is captivating um, different producers' imagination. On the left, you have um, a plate in the so-called willow pattern, um, which was transfer decorated. That, again, is copper plate engraving. You put, you ink it up, you put tissue on it, and then you uh, take that tissue and apply it to the plate. So every part of that image, um, both the uh, scene and the center part, as well as the border, is done through print technology. Um, and you can produce sets of these plates. So it's using British uh, kind of uh, technology on the British refined earthenware uh, body. And then in the middle, what you see is the way that uh, the potteries in Qing to Chen respond to that willow pattern, but using porcelain and they're hand painting um, all this. So this is not transfer decorated. There are gonna be variations, slight variations in all of them, but it's a Chinese response to a British uh, idea that's based on an imagined China. So, and then you get to the plate on the right, um, which is from Qing to Chen. And what you see here is it's hand painted uh, under glaze in blue, but it's painted to simulate the look of a transfer decorated object in and of its own. That that is, you know, it's, it's not a typical kind of intertwined uh, fluid pattern that you would find in terms of a hand painted Chinese uh, kind of um, uh, inspiration uh, of a uh, motif, but actually it's this isolated printed uh, looking um, kind of object, um, but it's done in a hand painted tradition. Um, so to me, this gets this really complicated thing. Is this Chinese? Is this British? Is it Anglo Chinese? Um, it's everything. Um, and, you, and it really sort of is the circulation of these objects um, and the awareness of markets as Staffordshire is competing with Qing to Chen for different parts of the ceramic market. Lacquer presents this other um, example of the movement of ideas and technologies. Um, the great um, uh, galleon trade uh, coming from Manila to the west coast of the Americas um, to Alcapulco, um, amongst those cargoes being collected in Manila from throughout East Asia was Japanese lacquer work, um, Chinese silks, um, and many of these uh, objects um, were coffers, screens, et cetera, the lacquered objects. Um, this is an example 
that was made for a European market, particularly a Portuguese market um, initially, but then shipped across uh, the Pacific that's very dense in terms of its use of gold and silver powders, as well as very thin pieces of mother of pearl, a kind of lacquer tradition called maquille, um, that was shipped. Um, it had a layover, if you will, for 100 years or so in um, in, South, in Central America, South America, at which point it gets um, some of its silver uh, kind of mounts, the corner pieces, the hasp uh, for the lock, those get added um, in silver. Originally um, in Japan, they would oftentimes be made out of copper. Um, so they've been upgraded with the use of American silver coming either from Mexico or from Potosi and uh, Bolivia, and then eventually work their way across the Atlantic and oftentimes are found in churches um, back in Northern Spain, where a lot of the um, uh, Spanish uh, colonial um, officials uh, came from. Um, so that this is an object that sort of speaks to lacquer um, being brought across the Pacific, incorporated within um, the Central and South American New Spain world, and then ultimately back to Spain. But at the same time, there's a local tradition um, in, uh, in South America that is using a, another kind of material um, that the uh, indigenous people referred to as mopa mopa, um, which was a small little bud of a, right at the base of a leaf of a certain tree in the um, the M upper Amazon, sort of on the east side of the Andes, um, in which this was chewed, it's masticated, and then stretched into something that is like saran wrap, um, and could was typically used um, by the indigenous people to cover gourds, um, natural uh, sorts of vessels. You could add colors from different natural ingredients while you're chewing and create all sorts of different colors, which then could be assembled like a jigsaw puzzle um, to create a pictorial um, kind of composition. And then sort of you could pen in certain things or maybe to think of it as a form of marquetry and um, that a technique used for wood, but in this case done with a very thin, sheathing, but it does the same thing that lacquer does. It provides a protoplastic um, kind of sealant uh, to uh, the base structure. And these uh, these artisans who worked with Mopa Mopa were then um, encouraged by the Spanish officials to start applying them to Spanish forms, uh, whether they be caskets um, or writing cabinets. And you see here sort of a, a way in which and when some people would say, oh, this is pseudo lacquer work, you know, they're imitating the kind of work that you see on the left, but actually it's a very different tradition. Um, it is coming from the indigenous know-how who are then applying it for a expanded market for the Spanish officials. And the Spanish even start to refer to it as something else um, from their own point of reference. They call it barniz de pasto, barniz being Spanish for varnish, Pasto being the capital of that part of uh, the vice royalty of Peru, basically, uh, as I said, in Colombia uh, now um, in the upper Amazon on the uh, east slope of the Andes. So this is needs to be seen on its own, again, as sort of a parallel world in the same way that we might think of um, Britware and blue and white porcelain. Um, these are coexisting um, and they sort of are in conversation, but they're not, one's not derivative um, of the other. One is not influenced per se by the other. You might even sort of thinking about um, ways in which objects and ideas uh, come together in the work of William Kick, who's a Dutch ornamental painter of the early 17th century, who sees lacquer work uh, coming from uh, Japan that is this sort of deep black uh, with gold powders. He starts to imitate sort of the crockware of uh, of those uh, plates uh, that are being exported, but he translate it, translates it into a form of lacquer that you see on the left, or even starts to incorporate some of the actual porcelain um, as the uh, the inset pieces of a set of plates um, that he's produced, um, all of which are sort of 
evoking crock porcelain, um, both in terms of the um, motifs around the border, using actual crock porcelain uh, in the in interior medallion, but using European materials of varnish, of uh, gold leaf, uh, polychrome glazes um, to produce this kind of hybrid um, type of object. Then we might think about um, ways in which an object could actually uh, stimulate uh, different kinds of responses and not from Europe down to, uh, to the far reaches of the empire, but sometimes it works in a variety of different ways. Here's an example on the left of a silk um, ground textile that has silk embroidery done in China in the 17th century that we know were used, uh, were, were sent as export items. There's, um, there's a temple in Kyoto has one of these. There are several other examples that sort of are dispersed and not used only in China. Um, but what was really significant about them is they had a peony in the middle flanked by phoenixes uh, with these rectangular borders with mythical creatures all around the side. But again, it's embroidery, silk on silk. But then what emerges in the uh, Vice Royalty of Peru um, is something that's got the same conventions of a peony in the middle, phoenixes on either side, mythical animals, both uh, Chinese uh, in origin, as well as vicuna and other local animals, alpacas. Um, but this is not embroidered. This is woven. Um, this is tapestry woven um, with camelid wool that is from the llamas, um, with cotton from the Peruvian coast. Um, and it's dyed red with cochineal, which is that insect that um, is affixed to cacti um, in Central and South America. So this is something that's motif-wise and compositionally, it's very much drawn from the Chinese example, but it's done all with local techniques and local materials. Late 17th century. It's only uh, in the 18th century that Portugal um, starts to copy some of the same thing in terms of, again, using embroidery, using silk thread embroidery, but it's on a linen ground, which is, again, sort of a common form of a ground for textiles. But again, you start to see the same sort of images. So it, it almost reverses the usual kind of from the center out to the periphery. Um, and again, sort of relocates us uh, in our geographies. Finally, thinking about meaning, sort of things are circulating, ideas are getting transmitted, materials are moving around or being uh, ideas are being translated into local materials. We might think about a couple different ways that meaning is accrued over time. So one might be the idea of gift. Um, a gift could be something as simple um, and as uh, sort of personal as a tobacco box, um, such as you see here on the left, um, you know, done in a um, with brass. Um, it's a gift from one person to another. It's so well appreciated. It's the engraving has worn because this has been uh, handled and uh, and touched um, so many times because it's it's handheld. This is something that's a small snuff box. And Sometimes this is the equivalent of a calling card um, in the early modern period that someone at Yale actually had 300 snuff boxes when he died. Obviously, it's not like he's going to have a snuff box in every room of his house or, you know, all over. He's giving them away um, as tokens of memory of, you know, remember my friendship. Um, um, and so I think it's really important to think about that idea of the personal gift um, that you have here. But you also can have another kind of gift that's built off of plunder, uh, which is what you've got on the right side, which is um, the um, original um, tent uh, owned by Tipu Sultan, um, the person who the British um, really thought he was the last person to defeat the British army um, after the revolution, was obviously after the American Revolution. Um, but um, the British so hated uh, Tipu Sultan, in fact, were worried that he was going to have an alliance with the French to drive the East India Company out of India uh, at the end of the 18th century, that um, they went all out to defeat um, and kill Tipu Sultan uh, down in Mysore. And this was, uh, you know, his palace was ransacked uh, by 
East India Company soldiers. And so it was seized as plunder by uh, Richard Wellesley, um, who presented it to Edward Clive, the governor of Madras at that point, and a member of the East India Company of sort of a tribute, um, and now hangs in uh, Palace Castle in Wales um, as sort of part of the Clive Memorial um, for their, uh, their destiny. We might think about uh, meaning uh, of appearance, of thinking about ways of art and science being combined together. Um, a chest on the left uh, from Boston um, with this burl veneer, that is sort of the diseased part of the tree that has this interlocking grain um, that creates this really uh, vibrant uh, kind of surface. This is not a time at which veneer is used because wood, there's a shortage of wood. There's so much wood in New England uh, at this point that it's important to understand what's the value of veneer. Um, and if you look at the ways in which the veneer is laid over those drawer fronts, and then there's a little thinner line uh, around uh, each of them outlining the burl, done in just sort of a plain herringbone uh, walnut. Well, one only has to look at the work of Robert Hooke um, and who wrote a book about sort of the, um, the idea of the microscope uh, in the 1660s and 1670s to realize that there's this great interest in the microscopic world um, at this point. He does cross sections of palms, um, palm trees and various other things to sort of look at the world of vessels of, um, you know, for trees and things like that. So Burl, if you think about this, this is like an illustration from Robert Hooke that you've got this close up microscopic detail of wood that's framed not by a black line of the engraving in uh, Hooke's book, but in this case by the herringbone veneer. Um, to think of this as microphilia um, writ three dimensionally as opposed to being in a book. Or to think about Sheffield plate of silver plating um, that we oftentimes tend to think about silver plating on a base metal as being cheap, uh, tawdry. Um, but again, in the uh, late 18th, early 19th century, this was considered the ultimate in the convergence of art and science. Um, the ability to roll with uh, heavy rollers, to roll sheet silver um, over a body and to then put it into a neoclassical form, which isn't really have relief carving or anything like that. It's really sort of the tautness of the facade um, really lent itself. Um, so you've got this way in which the science of rolling uh, silver plate and the aesthetics of neoclassicism come together to make this a desirable object, even amongst those who could afford um, solid silver um, at the same time. And then Final thing about meaning is touch, um, and it's to me it it really is the the language of material literacy, um, and you can see it within the connoisseurs um, of, uh, of of Chinese literature that you know all these points of uh, connoisseurship um, and collecting in the literati is about touch of feel of uh, bronzes and various other objects that. It's not simply an ocular centric um, kind of exercise, but it's full embodied engagement. Um, and it can be both the scholar uh, that you have on the left, but it can also be the language of the marketplace when people don't speak the same language uh, with kind of cultural tourism of the 19th century in which you've got these proper European ladies uh, in the copper souk um, in Egypt um, who are looking at uh, these kinds of um, copper alloy vessels. Um, language, you know, it's not, it's bits and pieces, but it's primarily through touch um, that people are understanding something about the workmanship. And so I just want to leave you with um, a sense of why a connected art history um, focused on functional objects is important. Um, for one, it provides an alternative to this idea of uh, chronological progressive stories that automatically assume a rise, um, a golden age and a decline. Um, it gets away from this idea of, of kind of a, a national narrative um, that everybody's divided out um, by country of origin um, and you don't see the connections between um, say um, 
greater Iran and China in terms of ceramics. Um, to think about the world's been much more connected than we think um, over time. I think of the principles of uh, sustained rigorous visual analysis, which is the basis of any history of art class. But what happens when you get embodied analysis in there as well? And this is where touch comes in. Um, this is where can you understand how these objects, how we as human beings interact with these objects? How do we wrap ourselves in these textiles or put our faces on the textiles? Um, how do we pick up a copper alloy vessel? Uh, what is it cold? Is it warm? How does it feel? And so to me, it's really about um, material literacy rather than this idea of taxonomical appreciation, be able to put something into a stylistic little pigeonhole. Um, oftentimes people are very, what I call object centered in which they have a series of diagnostic features uh, that leads to attribution um, that freezes an object in time. Um, but I'm interested in this kind of what I call object driven inquiry, that the object is merely a beginning point um, rather than an end point, that you can look at these features, but it can lead to an understanding of choice uh, from many possibilities, acceptance of change over time, the attention to the social life of an object, how it gets repurposed, where it maintained. Um, and this really allows us to think about objects as evidence, um, as historical evidence that helps offset the bias of written imperial records. It gives voice to anonymous makers, anonymous owners, uh, anonymous uh, circulators. Um, and I think ultimately the big the big takeaway when I'm teaching this course or with the hope of this book is that really stimulates both curiosity and tolerance about the material world around us, which ultimately leads to curiosity, tolerance, and engagement on a human person-to-person uh, -person level. So that's, I've gone on longer than I thought, um, but I hope that sort of gives you a overview of the book um, and its value. Thank you. Um, what a fascinating, um, presentation with the juxtaposition of the objects. Um, I want to invite uh, Malin. Yes, please. Thank you so much, Ned. Um, it's so interesting. And, you know, I've got a chance to see many, many beautiful objects for this early morning after the power outage out last night. This is like <laughs> really a real treat. <laughs> for those of you who are um, in other parts of the world, you know, uh, we had power outage on the eastern seaboard last night, which is um, quite interesting that we actually were able to pull together this event, you know, smoothly. <laughs> So I want to tell everyone that um, Professor Cook and I um, had um, a very lively phone conversation earlier, um, two days ago, you know, to discuss what, how we can uh, pursue this. And now that I actually have been, um, you know, going through all the questions that everyone put in, I think the first uh, set of questions that we thought, Ned, it actually might fit very well. And we're going to begin with the things on the cover of the book itself, you know, and that talks about um, a connected art history. Um, most of you might have known already, but let's do some recap, you know, why this word is quite um, unique for art historians, as well as cultural historians, the word um, connected history, uh, connected art history. Um, it has a long historiography, dating back to the really um, <laughs> ginormous debate between um, Godfrey Semper and Alorico in the 19th century. And to sum the two thick books written in German in two, three sentences, that would be um, Semper argued that there could be um, analogous origins of objects because of the places, you know, that the materials were created. Rico, on the other hand, said, well, you know, you by saying that you actually discounted what we call um, the wills of the artists and the many, um, many, many, many um, translations of Kunstwallen, you can look it up, you know, on that end. So then it leads us here, you know, and there were a number of uh, art historians who tried to reinterpret a kinetic art history, um, you know, we named many of them um, in our phone conversation, you know, and many of you might have known already, but in particular, um, the, um, David Summers, who also what they had described earlier, um, you know, in a similar attempts at trying to connect between art, architecture, space and time. So now we move forward to 2023. So how would you like um, to explain, you know, and redefine this connected art history that you have seen in the book? Um, and thank you, by the way, for the bullet points that you actually put in at the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, um, to me, it's, 
it's fascinating because you can think about um, Regal with this whole idea of uh, Kunstwollen um, and sort of the will of the artist. And what that really does is it really puts the um, primary power um, in the uh, intellect of the artist um, that, you know, they're going to overcome materials. Um, it's the individual genius. It's the um, it's an update to Vasari in some respects that we need to really think about this as a um, a real endeavor of um, personal creativity um, in, in some respects, as if it's sort of this genius idea that comes out of nowhere um, and sort of like overcoming materials even, right? You know, you impose your willpower, um, which is such a modern concept that, you know, we can, we can overcome any uh, kind of thing that through persistence and determination and in this case, uh, creative genius. Um, what that does is it it discounts, um, it puts everything within the um, kind of creative side of a brain as opposed to thinking about creativity comes in a variety of different ways. Um, I oftentimes think about the economics of um, this kind of process um, that a really skilled artisan um, can see something, can pick up ideas and then be creative in terms of transforming it um, to their own kinds of systems or their own market. I, I once talked to a contemporary furniture maker um, who summarized his whole approach um, to making a, a living um, through making things. He says, I do what people want my way. And it's, you know, there's a very simple kind of message there is that with my skills, I can do a lot of different things. And if someone comes to me and says, can you do this? I'm gonna adapt what they want um, doing it my own way. It's not as if they're gonna do exactly what that person thought, you know, it might look very similar, but actually structurally it's gonna be different or it might be a variation thereof. Um, and I think that that sort of gets at this uh, notion about um, the will of the artist um, and talking about the skill of the artist uh, in some respects. Mm -hmm to be able to adapt to different uh, markets, possibilities, opportunities, because ultimately they have to make a living. They have to survive. Um, and the way that one can survive, and this is where that idea of Semper was very much um, interested in materials and thinking about simultaneous um, kind of uh, action. And I don't, you know, sometimes things bubble up simultaneously, yes, but oftentimes there's a dialogue, there's a connection um, that uh, breeds that kind of almost simultaneous uh, kind of quality. Um, and to me, it, it is trying to understand this idea of connectedness um, that really allows you to put the agency back into a variety of um, artisans and artists, um, rather than thinking only a certain type uh, qualify for that. And to think about strategies, um, in some respects, the agency of the maker rather than the agency of some sort of abstract idea. I think the um, you know the um, the phrase of the agency of the makers really summed up you know um, pretty much the book itself because suddenly you put the voice back into the maker's mouth you know because otherwise you know we tend not to think about that as much as we do you know especially in the so-called traditional art history. Um, with that, you know, um, I would like to, um, I, I noticed there were a number of questions, you know, um, ongoing, you know, on the side that they asked some um, specific details, which I think I'm going to let them do that um, on their own. But all the questions that somehow, um, <clears throat> so being posed out there, underlying um, one particular notion about what exactly is the most typical beginning of us when we look at the objects. So all the questions that is on about clothes, you know, um, paper, ceramics, you know, when you have an object, where you begin, you're neither Semperian and neither are you uh, <laughs> Regalian. <laughs> so where do we begin? I actually um, talk about, I, I begin on the inside. Um, what I'm, you know, many times I think we're trained, um, a lot of art historians are trained, you know, as museum goers in some respects, um, that you start from the outside and work in. You start, you know, you, you do your visual take of something 
and then sort of work through um, a systematic way of looking. I actually oftentimes find myself with my head on the inside, um, thinking what's what's behind the um, the facade, and then working my way to the outside. And oftentimes, sort of then going back in, and and sort of it's often described sort of uh, an in and out process. And even as I'm on the inside, I'm thinking. What are some of the questions that I want to begin with about this time period, this place, um, et cetera? Um, so I'm, I look at objects inside out, um, I guess, you know, almost like that Congo cushion cover. I'm, I'm sewn on the, uh, with the reverse and then I'm put back together again. So then that moves us, you know, from the cover. Now we are making progress. We're going to table contents. But the table of contents, you know, we noticed that um, Professor Cook has the, the M themes. I'm not sure like why the M the M letter is so fascinating here, you know, but the M themes here. So basically- It's a good alliteration, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> like why don't it could be the A theme, you know? <laughs> so making movement and meaning. And in our conversation, you know, on the phone conversation we had, we had a, a very um, lively that, um, common understanding that that's actually the hidden fourth M theme. But that aim is actually um, money, monetary, you know, or economics. So because of these are all functional objects, you know, somehow it requires you know, demand and supply in order to make it happen. But that, you know, um, that you actually led me to the hidden fifth M theme that actually I missed at the beginning when we spoke on the phone, and that is Marxism. So could you elaborate on this so the rest of us can actually, um, you know, come to that um, agreement too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, money is sort of there a little bit in terms of um, some of the other M's, uh, as it were, um, in terms of access to materials, um, certainly in terms of circulation, um, you know, and even the objects themselves are a form of money um, that the Gujarati textiles or Coromandel Coast textiles, the painted cottons from the Coromandel Coast, serve as currency for the spice trade in um, in Indonesia. Um, that oftentimes people coming from Europe stop by Gujarat or um, Madras, pick up cloth and then take cloth to get nutmeg and ginger and things like that, and then bring that back um, to Europe. So there are ways in which some of these objects facilitate um, that kind of uh, exchange medium. And so, Thinking about money exchange, um, I think money is such a, a an interesting, you know, it's a more modern concept um, because I think that, uh, you know, here we are um, with uh, Vimo and uh, various other kinds of um, ways of electronic transfer of money. Um, you know, there wasn't even a standard currency um, for much of the uh, period we we're engaged with. But I, but I was interested in sort of when you raised the question about what's the fourth M um, in this, that I was thinking about Marxism just because in my attempt to try to think about um, the ways in which production and consumption aren't viewed separately, um, how do you start to understand the kind of um, synergetic relationship between production? You know, it's chicken and egg, which comes first, supply, demand. Um, and uh, you know, how to think about both of them together. Um, and thinking of Marx, you know, who has both an interest in labor as well as a uh, an interest in um, consumption. Um, you know, he's interested in the alienation of labor um, under uh, industrial capitalism. He's worried about the fetishization of the commodity. Um, but in some respects, what he's dealing with um, is a kind of early quantified economic history. Um, you know, he's trying to generalize. Um, and when he talks about commodity culture, and this is the way a lot of people from Apadura and others uh, really talk about it, um, it's almost like um, he's dealing in widgets, um, to use a classic economics term that. These are commodities that are sort of abstracted uh, in some respects, or they'll just say something like um, cotton um, or iron or, you know, sort of this bigger category. And I think what I'm interested in is trying to drill down a little bit and trying to get away from these aggregate um, kinds of um, elements and trying to think about, well, there's a whole range of cottons that could be available. Um, let's think about what's 
what kind of commodities are we talking about? Um, or on the part of labor, thinking about what does alienation mean? Is it only your uh, relationship to the uh, means of production, to tools? Um, what happens when you start thinking about other forms of engagement with labor as opposed to alienation? Um, what happens if you start thinking about making as problem solving? Um, not to romanticize in a Mauritian like William Morris, um, but is there a way in which people like the ways of problem solving, making objects, um, that it's better than sitting at your desk on a Zoom screen day after day after day after day? So that's, I mean, to me, that's trying to sort of be um, careful and evaluative um, with, specific, with specificity without being romantic, I guess. You know, um, that's something that I just realized right now that I didn't realize when we spoke, you know, on Sunday, that um, you are actually um, undermining all those big names. I mean, you know, including Semper and Rico, because when we think of um, what Rico and Semper tried to do, you know, they were trying to create a macro history, you know, mapping everything from the upper and create a pattern. But you propose instead that, no, let's look at each object and tell the story from each of them and to see how actually each one would connect. So this is like, you know, almost like you put dots all together and create a, a, a really, you know, global history from those um, particular reasons, which I think is thought to be so very uh, fascinating. And same thing, you know, that the way that you talk about Marx, you know, it's not that you rejected Marx, ent Marx entirely, but you said instead of looking at Marx, you know, as you have a theoretical uh, governance, let's not do that and see if this actually could be applied, you know, to these um, small functions, this um, group of people, these particular objects, and see if that can happen. And when we do that, what would be the story that we could tell? With that, however, um, you know, I have one more question just on this set of group of questions before we're going to move on that there are objects and their stories that you actually must have had to exclude due to you know the length of the book or how the story would work them together if you can what might you would like to bring them in say you know Princeton University Press gonna publish the second version <laughs> I hope that they hear this <laughs> yeah I mean that's one is always faced with um choices um and you know in, in terms of pulling this together I tried as much as possible to use objects that I've seen that I've actually or handled um, as much as possible because I think that that's there's so much about scale and uh, the way we interact with these things that is uh, that is crucial. Um, and then I had to think about things that um, have photographs. You know, and inevitably one has to sort of go through museum collections um, because of photography, decent photography, because you want it. You want clear imagery you can't just do sort of a quick shot uh, from my phone in the field um all the time although i've had to resort to that the so there's there's selectivity there's surviving for one and then there's selectivity um but i tried to compensate uh a little bit for that um by drawing from as many different kinds of you'll notice it it's I'm trying to be fair to all four media um, of um, that I've sort of decided to focus on. They're more universal media. Um, and I've tried to cover many different continents um, or regions um, as a way of being suggestive. Um, and you know, it, it really is borne out by the number of complimentary copies I had to <laughs> give out because of photo permissions. Um, I think it was something like 54. Um, which again speaks to the fact that I'm not going to one source only. Um, if I had to do it over again, um, I would really try to work harder um, in areas like um, Western Asia, Central Asia, um, in Africa. Um, and that's the kind of work that's just, or even like the uh, the Sindh area of the Hindus Valley um, in um, India, Pakistan. These are areas that are still very much um, tied to sort of local knowledge um, and things are just being worked on now. Um, and so much of what I'm doing is really trying to synthesize what has gone on in the way of many, you know, a lot of current work. This is where, you know, the kind of uh, graduates and even undergraduates I've been so fortunate to teach with um, 
that it's been, um, they really sort of keep me honest in terms of trying to stay up to date and trying to incorporate some of these others. So that's probably where I'd, I would continue to try to keep that breadth, um, but try to um, really get uh, even more varied representation, um, particularly think about textiles in Western Asia and metalwork. Well, I'll look forward to the second edition of the book. <laughs> I, I saw that the press is here, so take note of that. <laughs> now we've been to the cover, the table of contents, you know, and all the details and examples. Let's go to the um the back cover, you know. I saw that um you got a lot of people um endorses, you know, like pretty much no cover almost in um every um subfields of art history. Can I ask you that um since the book has been published, what might have been some of the most fascinating or most appreciated comments that you received from your readers? Um, I'm still wondering whether I'm the tree in the forest that fell and no one heard it. Um, you know, it's it's pretty early on. Um, so also I've got a sort of anecdotal um, kind of um, response. And I guess one of them, I mean, what I've, the people who have, I went to CAA, College Art Association in New York, and caught up with a bunch of friends. But it, it was curious how it was primarily um, younger scholars who were really responding positively, who who came up and said, you know, how excited they were and how they envisioned um, teaching with it, um, how it was so clear and so inspiring. Um, and to me, that that's important. Um, and you know, one person who's, whose work I really admire, who's mid-career, just saying, I could see using this for a number of different courses, um, which was exactly my intent, was to think of this not really as a textbook, as saying, oh, this is the way you have to teach, um, but actually saying this could be used in a methods course, it could be used in a different kind of a, uh, introductory course, or you could just do something on material culture. I mean, it could be used in a variety and deployed in a variety of different ways. Um, and so I got an inkling of that, but I won't know until, uh, and then I've had some students who read it uh, for orals in the fall. Um, they seem to get something out of it, but I don't know whether it's just, you know, what I'm always interested in is people, those who necessarily have not taught for me um, or done orals with me uh, within the Yale bubble, but actually, you know, people from totally outside. And that's just starting to happen now. Thank you very much. And um, I think this is a good start for the open Q&A, Carol. Um, there is, you know, um, quite a list of questions and some of them we already addressed in this conversation. So I'll let you uh, pick which one that you would like to zoom in. But thank you very much. This is very enjoyable. Thank you. Thanks, Vermalan. Thank you so much, Vermalan. And Ned for um, you know adding such richness to to the topic and the discourse in art history. Um, before I go into Q and A, I want to very quickly also thank um, my very important colleague Devin Lau for inviting both Ned and Vimalin. Um, I know probably Ling Shi Li from the Princeton University Press office is here. He's very instrumental in um, organizing this and also the teams of Yale Center Beijing and PUP. Um, and as Vimalan um, suggestively um, talked about the possible second edition or, you know, and, you know, Ned talked about, you know, wondering what the response would be for people outside of the Yale bubble to read this. Um, I know the Princeton University Press staff had um, put in some links for um, discounted purchase uh, within China for this book. So um, I'd be really curious about the responses.